Amen. Be seated. Well, good evening, church family. How are you? Fantastic. Thanks for coming out tonight. Appreciate you being here. We've got a guest speaker tonight, Thomas Harding. He's joining us. He's, he's from Georgia, not originally, from Ohio originally, but now living in Georgia with his wife and three boys. And uh, Thomas uh, has been called of the Lord to, to plant a church in Portland, Oregon. And so he's in the process of uh, going through deputation and raising funds and support to help with that ministry and mission out in Portland, Oregon. We were just uh, in my office before service tonight chatting and getting to know each other a little bit more and uh, just a blessing to hear what God is doing in his life. It, uh, it brought back memories of, of um, me in my late 20s when God was calling us to go out to New Jersey. And so it's, it's an exciting time. It's also a very scary time. And so I, I know uh, he's going to do a great work for the Lord, Lord willing. Uh, he, he comes uh, uh, to us tonight by way of reference from uh, Dan Renault, who's a, another pastor here in Lee Summit and a friend uh, connected with the Midtown Baptist Temple. And so it's a like-minded brother that uh, God has brought across our path. And, and we're excited to hear what, what God's doing in his heart, and he's going to bring a message to us tonight. So let me pray. And, and then, Thomas, you just come and, and share with us tonight. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful for the Lord Jesus Christ. We appreciate the chance to be here tonight to, to gather and sing praises to your name, uh, to hear uh, from you through your word. Uh, Lord, we pray for Thomas. We pray for him as he goes through this process and for the team that is going to be going out to Portland. We pray over him and his family, his wife and his boys. We, we ask that you would encourage them comfort them, bless them. Lord, provide for them. Uh, Lord, I pray you would build uh, big faith into them through this process, Lord. Uh, Lord, I pray even now for the souls in Portland. I lift them up to you. Uh, Lord, they, they desperately need to know the gospel of Jesus Christ and that there is a Savior that loves them and can heal whatever they're going through, can save them from their sin, and can give them a purpose in life. And so we pray that as he and his team go there in the next several months that you would uh, just help them to establish themselves in that community and they would build a church that wins souls and makes disciples. We pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, my friend. All right, hey, um, turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 13. We're going to get into God's Word together. I'll share a little bit of what God is doing uh, to take us to Portland as well. But uh, I don't want to neglect our time in the Word together. Uh, certainly, you guys know as well as I do that God's Word is more important than anything that we have to say. Amen. But I think there is a good example for us. In uh, Acts chapter 13, we see uh, the Apostle Paul's first missionary journey. And as the book of Acts uh, gets further along to this point in chapter 13, we have a transition that goes from Jew to Gentile. We start in Jerusalem and Peter and all the things happening. And then we get further and further away into a now uh, Gentile launching ministry with the Apostle Paul and Barnabas. They're going to be sent out of what I would consider a model church in Antioch a church that's sending and preparing men, a church that's reaching someplace greater than their little piece of land. And so I think there's a lot to learn from uh, our time in uh, Acts chapter 13. Today I'd like to see what a sending church is. Once you get to the field, what it looks like to interact with spiritual warfare, which nobody's really excited about, but it's the reality of the mission. And then how to stay on track after you've engaged in the fight. We have to, to choose to stay in the fight. So that's what we're going to see in Acts chapter 13. By the way, I, um, I'm currently a pastor at Oakland Heights uh, Baptist Church in Cartersville, Georgia. I've been there for seven years. Uh, I trained for ministry through uh, 
handful of different pastors, and then I graduated Living Faith Bible Institute, which is at a Midtown Baptist Temple in Kansas City. So uh, like-minded indeed, and I'm, I'm grateful for your church. I told him before uh, we began the, the level of trust he has in me to share his pulpit with somebody we, that we just met is incredible. I'm so grateful for that. I don't take that for granted. And uh, he's, that means he's letting me into your audience. And uh, I'm, I'm just truly grateful for that. And so hopefully you guys can get a heart for what God's doing in Portland. And join us at very least in prayer. I've already been surprised. Churches I haven't even visited have said that they were praying for us. And it's just amazing um, what God is doing to validate uh, what we're doing and going there. So let's look in Acts chapter 13, starting in verse 1. It says, Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon, that, is, that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene and Menaean, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. We'll stop there just for a moment, and we'll jump back into our story. But we're going to pick up in Antioch of Syria. Jerusalem is no longer the missionary launching pad. It is now a, a whole nother place in uh, we're going to go from Antioch in Syria to the island of Cyprus. Barnabas is with Paul. He's actually mentioned first in line here. Barnabas really is leading the trip. And we'll see that change throughout our time. And we'll learn that we need to have flexibility if we're going to remain on mission. But Barnabas goes to, you could say, familiar territory. Cyprus, according to Acts chapter 4, I think in verse 36, is his hometown. He has land there. So the first natural place to go is somewhat domestic for him. But I think what we see here is three signs of a church on mission. If we just glance into this church, first we see that they have good leadership. Look at verse 1 again. It says, There were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers. These men leading this church were known as prophets and teachers. They are Busy about the teaching of God's word, shepherding souls. And who's going to be sent to the field has to already be functioning at a high level. We send proven men to go from five leaders. There's five names listed down to three. Man, you've got to have a solid leadership that can handle that kind of change. So you could say it this way, that the mission is only as effective as the pastors are healthy. We need to have good pastors in our churches. I'm already just sitting across from your pastor. I know you have a good pastor. Yeah, good for you. You guys know you have a good pastor. You, sh you should take good, good care of him, but also make sure that he's able to do the work that he's called to do. According to Acts chapter 6 and verse 4, it says that we give ourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word. That's the role of a pastor. They need to be set apart to serve the Lord, to serve you, to prepare. And according to 1 Peter 5, to feed the flock of God, take the oversight, and be an example. If you want to be a church on mission, you need to have good leadership, and you do. Check. You guys qualify. Check. Next, we see that this church has a spiritual focus. In verse 2, it says, As they ministered to the Lord and fasted. Now, I don't know about you guys, but fasting is about the least satisfying thing you can do, right? Have you, is, have you ever fasted before? You go without food, you just drink water, you, and you'll survive. Unless, of course, you know, see your doctor and all the fine print. Um, if you take medication, you know, do your thing. But most humans will survive. If you just stop eating for a little bit and drink water, you'll be just fine. But this church, we see that they're focused on the right things. It's not an entertainment venue. It's not a cult of personality. It's not a Christian clubhouse. It's a place of worship. It says they ministered to the Lord. And in that time that they seek God and His will, which His will is that all would be saved and come to repentance, it says in verse 2, the Holy Ghost said, separate me Barnabas and Saul. We see then another sign of a healthy church is the ability to hear. 
What is God doing in our church? That's unique seemingly to each church. As Paul writes the different epistles, different churches have different situations going on. Perhaps you could say in a more modern context, different churches have a different ministry focus. Of course, the, you know, all the uh, ecclesiology, the, the structure of the church remains the same. But what does God want you and your church to do? If you just bring out a map, there's a bunch of places you could put pins on the map and say, let's go for that. But what does the Holy Spirit say he wants you guys to be a part of? By the way, I'm in no, no means intend to manipulate that to say you need to support me for that reason. I'm, I'm just, we're just looking at the text. But, but this makes me think about the way I'm getting to Portland. I'm uh, on staff at a great church. I love my pastor, my co-pastors. Our church is, is thriving. We've been through some things, but we're doing well. I get to oversee personal discipleship. We have about 53 relationships in our church. We have an in-house Bible institute that I get to lead and teach. And I'm so thankful. It's like all that I, you could ever dream in ministry. But we went through a season of prayer and fasting as a church, and we said, God, we want to be a sending church. With our Bible Institute, we're training men. We can't just hold on to them. We've got to launch people out into the world. So we prayed for that. I had school teachers, never fasted before, fasted three days, no food and water. And they, were, they had water, no food. They were excited. Man, I've been, I'm going three days without food. I'm so excited about what God's doing in our church. You're like, man, there's something wrong with you, bro, if, if you enjoy not eating. But through this season of prayer and fasting, we got launched into this survey trip going out to the Northwest to just poke around. I was voluntold I was going on that trip. I didn't sign up for the trip. I, it was paid for for me. They just told me I was going. We sent six leaders, two pastors, four deacons, and we just went to say, man, is this something that God might be up to? We just were scoping it out. And on that trip, uh, we had two people saved, and we all came back to say, man, there's, there's fruit in the field. Portland, we went to Portland first, then Seattle, and we said Portland definitely felt like it had more need. If you've seen it on TV lately, you know that they haven't made a lot of good decisions, and I do want to be respectful because it's a place I intend to reach, um, but it's pretty broken, and uh, it, it breaks your heart when you see it. So we all came back saying, yeah, we, we, need, to, we need to do that. Somebody's got to go. So for our church, a season of prayer and fasting is really what kind of launched me into going to the Northwest. It wasn't something I was looking for. And I believe in a lot of ways it's very similar to this. The Holy Ghost said, separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work I've, uh, whereunto I've called them. And you'll be delighted to know that I have a friend of mine who's a deacon. His name is David Allred. Him and his family are going with me. And we have two young ladies from our church that are single, uh, one of which my wife discipled. They'll be going with us as well. So uh, we're not going alone. Other people have heard that call. Uh, my pastors are on board. I have just done a ton of counseling, if you will, seeking uh, wisdom and knowledge of other folks like uh, veteran missionaries. Uh, I don't know if you support Brian Clark in London or James Fife, who was in Pakistan, but I put all my stuff and my, my finances, my vision in front of those guys and said, help me make good decisions. So I think God is in what we're doing uh, but we also get that from his word. I have specific places that he's directed me. I'd love to share with you more about that. And in order to keep me from rambling about my story and make sure we stay in our text, I did a couple uh, podcast episodes. If you want to get, I have some stuff in the lobby. You can follow us on Instagram and on, we have a website. And I'm not famous. I just have friends. So Brandon Briscoe from Midtown does uh, po uh, the postscript and he interviewed me on there. And my friend Kale Horvath is a missionary to Hungary, and he recently interviewed me on his podcast, we were like telling the story. So if you want to learn more, uh, we'll link you to those things, and you can check those things out. But we see the third thing of a church on mission is that they have sending authority. If you look to verse 3, it says that when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. In verse 4, so they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, Departed. Man, did you get the verses up there? Wow, you're awesome. Man, you guys are, you're doing great. I showed up without a, a presentation. You've already got one for me. That's awesome. Can you take the show on the road? Man, that's awesome. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, 
But here we see the, the pastors here lay hands on Barnabas and Saul and they, they say, we're with you in this work. But it's not just the pastors in verse 4, the Holy Ghost. And so there's a dual sending agency, if you will. But God uses his men to launch men into the ministry. They also have to clearly hear the call from the Holy Spirit. So if you want to go, if you want to be a part of the mission, you need to be subject to a pastor. You need to do that through the local church. You don't have to find uh, external means to meet your calling. God will use the pastors in your life to lead you, to lay their hands on you, and you're going to want their blessing when you go. In my case, I'm in your church just from a recommendation. I was in uh, Dan Renault's church this morning, Living Faith Lee's Summit, and he knows your pastor, and you want to have those kind of connections. I can't create those kind of connections. You just want to go with God's blessing. So we say it this way in our church, don't be a went one, be a sent one. Don't went out on your own. Make sure you get sent out. But let's talk about your calling for just a moment and discerning your calling. And I'll inject my story a little bit as well. We see in verse 2 that these, these men are called. And then we see in verse 4 that they're sent. Maybe there's something that you would consider in your heart. If the sky's the limit, if I get one life, if I want to seek the kingdom first, what what am I going to do for the Lord? Maybe you've got a burden, a passion, a, a mission, a vision. How you discern that that calling is not just how you feel, which has gotten the Northwest in a lot of trouble just making decisions on how we feel about things, but it's actually biblical. So I've got three things for you. First, is there a need? In verse 2, the Holy Spirit says, for the work whereunto I have called them. Barnabas and Saul have a work that God has called them to do. There's something that needs done. So do you have a need or an opportunity? Second, are you prepared? Verse 1 says that there are certain prophets and teachers. They're already functioning at a high level. And we know from the rest of the Bible, 1 Timothy chapter 3, the qualifications of a pastor is not a novice. So you may want to go, you may see a need, but if you aren't prepared, you're not going to be able to take the shots. You're not going to hang in there when times get tough. And thirdly, do your pastors agree? As we see in verse 3, they laid their hands on them. If you have some of those things lined up in your life, then it, it's very well possible that, man, God's calling or commissioning you to do something. But if not, if you're still waiting on one of those pieces, then I want to leave you with 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 20, which says, Let every man abide in the same calling wherein he is called. For now, if the door is not open, if you are not equipped, if your pastors are not on board, then God needs you to be faithful where you are. You're, the people in your job around you need you. The people in your community, in your family, the people in your church, in your children's ministry, your student ministry, in your band, wherever you are, God needs you wherever you are. Be faithful there first. And then go as he gives you opportunity. But let me give you, since we're getting to know each other, you guys have been very good so far. No tomatoes or anything. Thank you. You're even putting up with my mustache, which I know is ridiculous, okay? I'm going to fit in in Portland. That's kind of what this thing's all about. It's kind of a strange place, you know. That and along with, I'm currently homeless. Uh, in, in March, we sold our home. I mean, I didn't even try. It was just the Lord just worked it out. And it's kind of been a scary ride. Uh, we sold our home and we've been doing the deputation thing. We purchased a motor home and we're just currently moving our family around in a big box to different places right now. So I fit in real good with my weirdness and my homelessness. Fit in. Sorry, I don't, I don't mean, I'm just joking. I don't mean to be demeaning. But I want to tell you a little bit about uh, my experience and what the sending has been like for me. So I come from First Baptist Church, New Philadelphia, Ohio. If you're familiar with our circles, Mark Trotter used to be the pastor there. So he was my wife's pastor. I came after him when Jeff Bartell was the pastor there. And uh, I was serving in our addiction recovery ministry and our jail ministry. And I was preparing to teach Genesis chapter 12, the call of Abraham. 
and uh, it, it's, it's Abraham's taken to a place that he's not familiar with. God's taking him to a new land, a new country. And it was one of those times when God's word just pressed on my heart and God was saying, you're going to move. And I, and I was content in New Philadelphia. I was raised there 31 years, had my first uh, child there. So I began meeting with my pastor, like, hey, I'm not trying to be a went one. I, I just, I don't know what God's doing in my life. So we began meeting regularly. And then he had said, uh, well, I, I know somebody in Georgia that has a youth ministry opportunity, but we both know you wouldn't be any good at that. <laughs> and uh, that was true. I was not interested in youth ministry. It was not some passion or burning desire that I had, but I had God's word. I had the sending agency of my pastors and I had an open door, something, the work that needed to be done. So I spent the last seven years in Cartersville, Georgia. Uh, I discipled myself out of a job in student ministry. We just ordained a pastor in my place over student ministry. Praise the Lord for that. And in the last three years, I've been overseeing our discipleship ministry and our uh, training stuff, as I just said a moment ago. So that's one example of a move. This is just my life, just being vulnerable with you. The second move from my current church, Oakland Heights to Portland, um, was coming back from our survey trip. I still wasn't fully convinced uh, to, to plant a church there. It was just something I was postulating in my mind. And the very next day after I got back, I was reading through Luke chapter 15 and verse four. And Jesus says, what man of you having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the 90 and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it. As we walked around the northwest part of the city, it's very pedestrian. I could not find a church to attend. And when we Google Maps and zoomed in and looked around, it was like there are, like, there's not any options. Like it's what we would consider church. There are very few options. And our church at the time, the opposite is true. Oakland Heights is training. We just ordained a pastor. We have a goal of planning five churches in the next 10 or 15 years of uh, ordaining and sending three men by 2025. That's looking like that's gonna be happening. I'm one of those. My friend Chris is another one of those. And we're, uh, we just had a missionary to uh, not Kathmandu, I think, that uh, he's gonna be going on another Portland trip with me to, to check the field out there. So Oakland Heights is killing it. We're slugging it out. And then you look at this other field and there's just nothing. So that began to turn my heart towards it. So you could say, I have God's word that provoked me. I have the agreement of my pastors. At what time I told them, hey, I want to plant a church in Portland, they all started laughing at me, which wasn't very nice. <laughs> but they had saw it on me as I had been processing that I've not been able to stop seeing Portland in my reading. By the time I told them, they were like, duh. <laughs> and they had immediately said, they quoted Proverbs 18.1, uh, through desire, a man seeketh and intermeddleth, uh, separateth himself and seeketh and intermeddleth with all wisdom. And they said, be separate to this cause, essentially. Uh, we'll give you a budget, plan trips, read books, go figure that out. And I was like, well, I, I was kind of hoping you'd say no. And that didn't happen. So I have God's word. I have the agreement of my pastors. And I have an open door. If you've seen a field that needs a church and it's broken, uh, you just, you know that there's opportunity there. So that's where we currently are with sending me to Portland. Our church is behind it. Uh, I have a fellowship of churches that are behind it. I intend to be set up this summer so that next summer we can have mission trips, if you will. People come. Our mode, our mode uh, I almost said modus operandi, but that's a whole other language. Uh, our mode of operation on the field with these evangelism trips to try the field to see if it's good, if it'll produce fruit. As I, we, didn't, we literally didn't know anybody there. Our mode has been hit the streets with the gospel and see who wants to get saved. That's all we've done. I'm just ridiculous enough to be the one to do that. I mean, honestly, it's kind of like old school. We made a tract, we developed a website, and we just said, hey, who wants to get saved? And about 0.01% of people want to do that. So it's not a super high conversion rate, but I do want to have trips that supporting churches are able to come. We'll train you in evangelism, if you, you probably already know, but we'll get you some tips and then we'll point you at lost people and we'll just try to get to Jesus as quick as we can. 
So I'd love for you to come and engage that. And something that really drew me to it was, I've been around the US, but it, Portland did not feel like the United States. It, it's, you know, we're a post-Christian society now. And we have a whole society, a whole population of people that have said, yeah, we're, we're over that church thing. And the end of that just doesn't work out well. But once you get on mission and you say, all right, I'll go, man, I'll sell it all, forsake the mission. We look at Barnabas and Saul, they're going to go to new territory. No one's done what they're doing. We are all, we're all, they're the model for it now for us, but no one's done it. Well, once you show up on the field, you'll find that it's not all exciting like you had thought it was going to be in your head. So let's look at verse 5. We'll read verses 5 through 12 in Acts 13. And let me get a drink of water real quick. It says, And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had also John to their minister. And when they had gone through the isle into Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar-Jesus, which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man, who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. But Eliamus the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn them away, or turn away the deputy from the faith. Verse 9. Then said Saul, or then Saul, who also, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, O fool of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness. Wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness. And he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. So we get sent out of Antioch, we come to Cyprus, somewhat domestic territory. We get to the other side of Cyprus and we meet our first convert that we know of on this journey, a man named Sergius Paulus. He's a Roman proconsul, and he has a sorcerer that's helping him divine things. This is not uncommon in the ancient world. Someone to help you divine your leadership decisions, and no doubt it was supernatural. And honestly, I believe this still happens today. The occult is a part of our society, and people get information that they should not otherwise have, and that's the way the world turns. But here, this man is called a sorcerer. And I know some of you think that's just in Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings, but magic and witchcraft is all, all over our day today. It's especially in the Northwest, it's just spooky and weird, and they like it. In so much that we, when we go there, I, one of the places I take our teams to in Portland is called Powell's Books. It's, it's a city block that's the largest bookstore in the U.S. And we, someone asked, I don't know why they asked, but they said, where are the Christian books? And uh, one of the workers sent them to the witchcraft section, like on purpose as a joke, like, oh, they're over there, you know. That's just how Portland is. It's kind of spooky and weird. But I bet you. If you would go to Marshall's or TJ Maxx, you would see sage, crystals, and books for incantations. I've seen them myself. I've taken pictures of them. They, it, it exists in our modern day. And if you know anything about it, you know not to mess around with it. There's a particular movement today that's confused with gender and identity. It is opposed to the truth. And there's a power in the movement. It's not even necessarily a political one. It's a spirit. We see this word sorcerer show up in Exodus chapter 7. It says, Then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers. And you know, they were able to do some of the things in like manner that Moses was able to do. When we fast forward to the New Testament, 
Paul shed some light on the names of these guys, Jans and Jambres, he said they withstood Moses. He says they also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. You need to know that when you get on the field and you're trying to share the gospel, man, the good news of Jesus will sing the songs. We love them in our hearts so much. There are people that are opposed to that message. They are empowered by another spirit to withstand. Look at what it says here in verse 8. It says, He withstood them seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Just as much as God is at work in the world drawing all men to himself so that all can be saved, our adversary, the devil, has blinded the minds of them that believe not. Yeah. Right? So don't be, distra don't be uh, surprised when key men in ministry are distracted by the forces of darkness. Maybe you've seen this as you're leading people, shepherding people, evangelizing, making a disciple. Something gets their attention and it's turning them away. It's withstanding the truth in their life. Brothers and sisters, this is where prayer and fasting comes in. Jesus says in Mark chapter 9, this kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. Some spiritual darkness requires a greater than natural means. Even Jesus himself fasted in spiritual warfare. But you don't have to be afraid. This, Paul doesn't back down. If you just look back to our text, he stands up. He has something to say. He actually condemns this guy. He has some pretty gutsy claims. He actually performs a miracle here. We see the signs of an apostle exercised by him, according to 2 Corinthians 12, 12. Paul is able to uh, do some supernatural things through, through being, by being an apostle. He puts a mist and a darkness on this sorcerer. This is where we see Paul change his name. It, if you would go back to his sending, uh, Verse 2, separate me Barnabas and Saul. Now whenever we get uh, down to this part, we see uh, his name change. I know that I got that somewhere. Verse 9, then Saul, who, is, who also is called Paul. This is the first time that name is used, Paul. It's after performing this miracle, and we're going to see in, in a moment, this role shift, Barnabas take a back seat and Paul take the front seat, the driver's seat, if you will. But just so you don't get any funky ideas, you, you don't have to try to put a mist and a darkness on anybody. You don't have the gifts of an apostle because one, that office is closed according to Acts chapter one. But two, we also have a completed word of God that is a more sure word of prophecy, right? The Bible says in 1 John 4, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Amen. You don't have to play around with darkness. Right. If you want to accomplish the mission, you're going to need power. And you get that through the Holy Spirit that lives in you and the Word of God that you're consuming and renewing your mind with on a daily basis. And if you need to, it's your weapon. It's your sword. You quote it out loud if you need to. Maybe you guys just haven't been in enough spooky and weird situations to be in that place. But when we're on the street engaging with people, we're in a crazy weird place. I mean, it doesn't feel like the United States. And we're, honestly, we're getting, we're, <laughs> we're stopping strangers on the street. We're kind of asking for it. But when we're talking to people, it's not uncommon for me to be able to, to go through Romans Road with somebody and literally sharing the gospel and have drug addicts come up and get in between me and the other person that I'm talking to and just make weird sounds and intimidate us. We had one guy just get on the ground on his hands and knees and just say, uh, he accept that Jesus is God, you know, just say weird stuff. Just Satan trying to intimidate you. At some of those points, you just have to quote God's word. I got no other power, man. This isn't of myself. You need to cling to the sword. You're going to be in a battle once you get on mission. Even if it's here in Lee's Summit. If it's at a birthday party, 
You know, you know what I'm talking about when someone comes up at just the right time to just interrupt that moment where spiritual truth is being dispensed into someone else's life and then something happens and you're like, what? But let's talk about staying on mission. If we continue in Acts 13, if you look at uh, verse 13, it says, Now when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they came to Perga and Pam Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch and Pisidia and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. So here we see this shift of leadership. Barnabas is going to take over. We're going to lose a launch team member, if you will, in John Mark. And I think staying on mission, especially after taking some shots, is going to require some flexibility. You guys like change? I don't like change either. My wife um, is very, very organized. I'm super grateful for that. But for some reason, sometimes she decides that things need to be in different places in my home. When I go to open the closet and I'm like, there's my, wait, what? I don't even know where my clothes are anymore, right? And sometimes I get upset in this spirit, of course, always. <laughs> and she'll say, you want to move us all the way across the country and I can't even move your clothes? <laughs> well, that's a good point. So I'm working on flexibility. I'm a bit of a control freak, if you will. I like to be, you know, in control. But if we're going to stay on mission, we're going to need some flexibility. So I've got three ways for you to stay on mission. And maybe you're not going to be a sent one. Maybe you're already on mission. Maybe you're making disciples. Maybe, man, you're doing it. Well, here's how to keep doing it. First, adapt to your surroundings. You have to be willing to adapt. Look at verse 13. It says, now when Paul and his company. So there we see again, Paul is the new guy. This is the name change. We go from Saul, which means desired, to Paul, which means small. Paul is able to put off his Pharisee roots. He's a rabbi. He, he'll pick them back up if you continue reading. He's going to preach in a synagogue if you just go after our text. Go home tonight and read that. But he's willing to be flexible to say, okay, we were just in Paphos. A Roman proconsul was saved. Man, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I mean, we're reaching the Romans now. So I'm going to use my Latin name. I'm going by Paul. And I think what this represents for us is that missional Christians have a willingness to surrender their core identity to reach other people. I'm willing to put off what I think I need to be to be more effective engaging in, in the lives of other people. I know this isn't exciting. It takes a lot of maturity to be able to do that, and we don't always love it. But just think about it for yourself. What do you identify as? Your nationality, ethnicity, your recreation, your politics, some kind of religious preference. It's okay, obviously, to have an association. But when you're going to be on mission, if you're going to engage people with the gospel, you have to not take the bait in a conversation. This is what I call it. Let me explain. Taking the bait is when you're trying to get to Jesus in a conversation, but somebody else says, well, what about whatever other thing you could possibly think about? Socialism, homosexuality, anything that is going on in our world, women's rights, whatever the things are, what's going on in the Middle East? If you're not careful as you're trying to get to Jesus, you're going to take the bait in something that doesn't help you get to Jesus and you're having a totally different conversation that will not lead to anybody else's salvation. And that doesn't mean you can't use apologetics, to, apologia to uh, interact and engage. We can think and reason. Paul does that on Mars Hill. He quotes a secular poet. You can do that if you're capable. That's fine. But you can't do that and never get to the gospel. 
And so we need to say, hey, man, I have a real particular, pre I have a, a political preference. I mean, I think we all do when we're talking about law and order. But when I'm engaging you, that's not, I'm not trying to convert you to conservatism. I don't, you, that doesn't save your soul. And if I just go preaching Fox News to you, I, I, that's not going to save your soul either. Now, obviously, the Bible gives us a worldview, right? Like, we, we know how to think and reason. Some of that needs to be saved for your disciples. Teach them how to see God's word through the lens of God's word. Uh, through, see the world through the lens of God's word. I'm sorry I've talked a lot today and my words are all like, I'm running out of my word limit for today. So I'm going to go home tonight and have no, no more words left. But we have to be careful not to take the bait. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, uh, in verse 19, he says, I made myself servant unto all. The same guy here that we see changing his name. This is what he says later to the, to the Corinthians. In verse 20, he says, Unto the Jews became I as a Jew. He says, To them that are without the law as without the law. To the weak became I as weak. And this I do for the gospel's sake. So you need to be able to take away whatever hinders you in a conversation on getting to Jesus. Even if that's a sports team. Are you going to set up barriers? Be like, ah, I don't like that team. I'm, listen, I'm a, I'm a Buckeye. I'm from Ohio. And they say we don't give a, about the whole state of Michigan. You, you could probably fill in the blank. Y'all are educated people. But that's, when I engage with somebody from Michigan, that's not what I'm going for. I don't want to argue about football. Do you know the Lord? We could give each other a hard time if we're saved. That's fine. But if, if you're not saved, man, I don't want to distract you from getting to Jesus. So one, if you want to stay on mission... Don't get distracted. You need to be willing to adapt and even put off some of your core identity to reach others. Secondly, you need to be able to follow the leader. This is not a, an incredibly um, popular sentiment in our world today. To follow somebody. What we see here is, if you go back to verse 2, Separate me, Barnabas, and Saul. But now, when we get to uh, the end of our text, verse 13, now when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, we clearly see a shift in leadership. And Barnabas could have said, bro, I made you, Saul. If you just go back to Acts chapter 12 and prior, you see that Barnabas is the one He's, he's, a, he's a, the son of consolation. He's bringing Saul along into Antioch for Saul to grow and become this prophet and teacher. Barnabas, Barnabas could have easily been like, bro, sit back down, man. I'm in charge. I made you. And instead, he was able to recognize the shift was from the Lord. He said, all right, I'm following you, Paul. Where are we going? Away from the homeland. That's where we're going. If you look at a map, you go from Antioch to the island of Cyprus, and then there's a hard turn where they go north to Antioch and Pisidia. So a good leader knows when it's time to get in the back seat and let someone else drive. If you're not able to submit to wisdom and counsel and, and the input of your pastors, man, you're going to make a shipwreck of the mission somewhere. You've got to be willing to be flexible. And lastly, you need to endure difficulty. The mission's not always going to be easy. Living in a place where there isn't an established church and you're making one, and the city really doesn't want one, the course of this world doesn't ever want one, it's not going to be easy. And some of the shots that we take, you know, they're not from lost people. We expect it out of them. You know, we see the chess match that God and Satan have going on at times. Some of the hardest hits come from within. In verse 13, it says, And John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. John is John Mark. John Mark was the nephew of Barnabas. He's not sent out as a prophet and teacher, but he, it says they had him to their minister. 
He was their disciple, if you will, servant boy. He was growing. This journey, though, became too hard. Maybe it was the witchcraft. He's just like, man, I don't, y'all are crazy. Paul's in charge now. Man, I don't, I don't think I'm following. I didn't sign up for that. I signed up for my uncle Barney. I don't know about following Paul. But we have here a core launch team member that said, hey, I'm out. I'm going back home to mama. He goes back to Jerusalem. If we'll let the people that bail on us affect our effectiveness in the mission, we're, we're never going to make it. And it's tough. It seems like the first couple of disciples you try to make, something always happens and they fall out. And y'all, I'm the discipleship pastor at our church. I get to oversee the relationships and give counsel and wisdom to it. And in the last year, uh, last year, what year is it? I don't even know what day it is sometimes right now, living on the road. Last year, I had a guy that I brought on as a disciple. Uh, He didn't make it. I'm the discipleship pastor. I still have failures. Look at Jesus. Jesus had 12 and eventually, you know, smite the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. People are going to disappoint you. I have uh, uh, one, one guy that I really like uh, w- reading about Bible things said it this way. John Phillips, he says, difficult people. They are one of the problems in the Lord's work. People who seem enthusiastic and dependable, but who let you down just when they are needed most. People who volunteer in a burst of zeal, but as soon as the pressure of other things is felt, abandon their commitment. The story of missions and of the Lord's work is littered with stories of such people. People who who say, I'll go, or I'll help, or count on me, and who back down after just a little while. Have you ever seen that before? Hey, yeah, I'll sign up to serve in children's ministry. Sure, you get one or two weeks into a rotation. The next thing, oh man, I just, I can't. I got a Saturday night. (laughs) I'm going to cancel. I'm going to bail. Do you guys have that kind of issue as well? No, all your children's workers are amazing. Good for you guys, man. That's awesome. But there are times in the mission when we just have to soldier on. As Paul says in his last words to Timothy, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Are you going to endure the hardness and the mission even if people fall out? Even if people that you've walked with alongside for a long time decide to walk away? There is hope for you though. Maybe some of you here have had failure and you're ashamed. As we've all failed. Peter failed. You'll be delighted to know that John Mark was restored to the Lord. Barnabas and Paul, they had to split ways over that one. But Barnabas, the son of consolation, he he has another guy that he's going to bring up. He takes John Mark. And we know through history that uh, Peter invests in the life of John Mark. It's where we believe he got his gospel from. He got to write a book of the Bible. And Paul says in the end of his life in ministry that he's profitable to me. So it's possible that after failure, you can be restored. If you have failed, you need to find Barnabas. You need to find somebody who will take you under their wing. They will bring you along. You need to find Peter who will remind you what Jesus did for you. And God can use you still. There's hope for you. But as we think about our time together today, We see this sending church. They're involved in some next level stuff that no one else is doing. They just got a heart for the mission. They're hearing from God and they're willing to build men, send men. What about you guys? Are there any people in this church that would go? Does God have a call on any of y'all's life? Maybe just some contemplation, discernment, meeting with your pastor to figure that out. Why not? Young people, what, what, what else would you give your life to? Jesus died so that everyone could know him. There's no greater cause. At least consider it. But once you do, you've got to be trained and prepared because there's a spiritual battle. You have to be equipped. And if you're going to stay on mission, you have to be willing to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow him. Your identity 
has to slowly fade to black. You're still the unique person that God created you. You just don't let it get in the way of the mission. And no matter what happens, if other people fail or if they follow, you say, God, I'm going. I'm in. I'm going to be a good soldier. I want to be faithful. I want to, I want to see fruit. I want to buy a field. That can be you today. What step would God have you to take in that direction? And maybe that's just being faithful here in your field and praying and supporting for people like us. I'm giving my life to it. I could do a whole lot of other things, but I want to see a church planted in a dark place. And I'm going to need your prayers. So would you pray for me? Can we, can we pray together now? Would that be all right? Let's pray. God, we come to you tonight and we're thankful for time together. Your word, the gospel, is really why we're here. If it weren't for what you did on the cross for us, man, we'd have no business being together. But you gave us a mission. You love the world. You send us into the world. God, I pray for this church here. You, you put us together for tonight. I'm so thankful for the open door. We know your word doesn't return void. And even if they don't remember me, God, would you burn in the hearts of the people in this church a desire for the mission, a desire to make disciples, a desire to train and send or even go. And as men stand up to say, I'll go, will you give them the support that they need in this body? And even for us, if we have a relationship, God, help us to know what that is. Give us wisdom. Be with the pastor. I pray for him, God, that However he leads his flock, even if it's not me, Lord, just as a pastor, give him wisdom over his flock to train men, develop men. What is their part in the mission? I pray that you'd help him in Jesus' name. Amen. Thomas, thank you, my friend. Appreciate you. You know, I'm always encouraged to hear how God is working in the lives of people. Everybody has a story. And it's a unique story, isn't it? And I, and I just want to remind us as we finish up tonight that, that God has a calling upon your life. You need to know that. God has a unique calling for you. Uh, some, of, some of you, that's going to involve just being here and being faithful, and serving in the ways that God gives you opportunity. For some of you, that may involve moving to a different place, and helping with the work somewhere else, going around the world and serving on the mission field in some way. But I want you to know God has a calling upon you. Uh, there's, a, there's a common uh, cliche that says the best ability is availability. And so if, if we can make ourselves available to God, God will open the doors and show us where it is that he desires for us to serve him. I, I, I think of the story in Isaiah 6 as the prophet Isaiah has his encounter with the Lord. And, and he comes to the point where he answers God's call, and he says, here am I, send me. He was available to do what God wanted him to do. And so never forget that, that God has something for you to do, and, and we just need to be available for him to do that. Make sure you uh, show some love to Thomas on your way out tonight. Uh, he's got some information out on the table uh, grab some of his prayer cards and some of his, his items out there, and then pray for him and his family as God prompts you and reminds you to do that. He mentioned to me in our conversation before the service tonight that he's at about 50% of the funds that he needs to raise in order to support him and his family when they get to Portland. So pray for that, that God would help him to raise the remaining amount, and pray about what God would have you to do in terms of supporting him. Be sensitive to that. God, what would you have me to do with respect to that? I'm sure he can share with you uh, ways that you can support him in his ministry. If, if you'd rather give through grace, we'll make sure that that gets passed along to him as well. Uh, but please be obedient and be sensitive to what God would have you to do in terms of supporting him, whether that's by prayer, notes of encouragement, or financially. Please do that for him, all right? Let's pray one last time and we'll be dismissed. Father, we love you. We thank you for the Lord Jesus. Lord, everything... Uh, is for you. It's for your glory. Lord, um, it, it's not about us. It's about you. It's about your mission. It's about 
seeing people saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we just we want to be about your business and whatever time you may give us here on this earth, whether that's here in Lee Summit or in Portland or in Georgia or wherever we may find ourselves, Lord, we just want to be obedient to what you desire for us to do. We thank you uh, for Thomas being here with us tonight and for sharing some of his story with us. Thank you for the message from Acts 13 that he brought. Lord, we pray over him and his family. We pray your blessing upon them. I pray that their remaining time in the Kansas City area would be a fruitful time and that they would be encouraged by uh, all the visits that they have scheduled. Lord, we love you and we thank you for Jesus and we pray it in his name. Amen.